So we're working through 2 Timothy, and we just kind of finished chapter 3, and we really only have one more chapter left, but we're kind of taking a little bit of a break, like, I guess we would call it, we're going to use a fancy term like an excursus, which isn't really a break from 2 Timothy, it's more like a kind of, it's like a parenthesis, think of it um, like a parenthetical thought. We just looked at the inspiration of scripture while we're here, we'll spend a week or two, it just depends on how today goes, uh, th looking and thinking about this from a theological perspective before we jump back in to chapter 4. So, knows the there? Yeah. Uh, so we can kind of treat this a little bit more like a Sunday school type of a setting, but for those of you who are kind of used to the way we used to do Sunday school around here um, before the pandemic hit, we can kind of treat it a little bit like that. There could be some questions. I, I, I will say that you may hear that's an issue we're going to deal with later or next week. You may hear that. I just, I don't know exactly how far we're going to get on this tonight. It's possible we get the whole thing done. I highly doubt it. I think it's probably two weeks. I think it's just week next week. But anyway, uh, we're going to talk about the inspiration of Scripture a little bit. Now, we were off last week because of Mother's Day. But two weeks ago, we talked about... Uh, a little bit about what inspiration means. And it's not that I was inspired to do something uh, or that I was mentally stimulated to do or feel to do something or feel a certain way. Uh, like that movie inspired me to be a better husband uh, or that book inspired me to be a better dad. And that's not that type of a thing. So when we think that when we talk about the inspiration of scripture, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, what we're talking about is what the word in the original language means. And where we ended last week in 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is inspired by God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And this word is uh, God breathed. All right, it's, it's a compound word. They have new stuff, so it's God, theos, God. And pneuma, which is uh, breath, wind, spirit, uh, God breathe. It's the it's the breath of God. So uh, the scriptures are inspired. They are the very breath of God, breathed out by God. I believe the English Standard translation says that all scripture is uh, God breathed. Does anyone have the ESV on them? I suppose we could flip it up real quick here. I believe that's the translation. Breathed out. Breathed out. All scripture is breathed out by God. So they, they, have, it, they have it right here. In fact, uh, I believe in the uh, New American Standard footnote, there's a little footnote that says literally God breathed. So that's what it literally, that's how it literally translates. God breathed. Scripture has its origin in the mouth of God. In the mind of God and in the mouth of God. The question we want to look at today, really, is how did God inspire? We talked about this just a tad last week. Maybe this week is a little bit of a summary. Again, it depends on how far we get. Uh, did God dictate his word to the authors? That is, uh, Isaiah sits down in a chair and God takes over Isaiah's hand, and Isaiah's hand just starts moving and writing what God says. Or uh, is that is that what God did? And we would say, no, that's not what God did. Or or did did God tell? I mean, listen, there were times where Isaiah writes out things like, "Thus saith the Lord." Right? There was there was clear there were clear times where God was speaking, where Isaiah was recording messages from God. Did God dictate 2 Timothy? As in, uh, Paul, listen, I'm going to, God is telling me to write a letter to Timothy, and so Paul's just like, okay, so, uh, you can tell me what's right next. All, all scripture is what? All scripture is given by inspiration. Uh, is, is that how the scriptures were inspired? Is that how they would read that? Were they dictated? And we would say, no, they weren't. Uh, God used individual personalities to write his word. He used individual writing styles. We, we actually talked about this. It's been a little while. It's been about five years since we've had this conversation. Just kind of one of the reasons why I want to do it again. You know, every, every few years, it's good to have 
a conversation about the inspiration of scripture like this. Well, God uses individual personalities. He uses individual writing styles. He used the language that the Apostle Paul used. And you wonder, how in the world did he do that? You know, God breathed out his words through the very writing styles that Paul would use or the style that Moses would use. He, he used the people. He used the personalities. He used their writing styles. Now, there are some people out there who think that all Christians should be exactly the same. And uh, we should be super serious, and we should be stoic, and we shouldn't crack a smile ever when we are in the house of God, when we are in the sanctuary, right? And, uh, and, and there are people who have like this, you know, we all must be the same, and we all must be that very serious, stoic person. But that's not even how God dictated his word, or inspired his word. Dictates the wrong word again, but that's not how God brought out his word. He used individual writings. And by the way, he uses individuals today. None of us is the same. All right, that's proper English, by the way. It doesn't sound right. But it sounds like I'm supposed to say none of us are the same, but it's none of us is the same. None is the same, right? I think you can say either way, but nevertheless. So, so we're all different. And, uh, and we all have different personalities. And really, God kind of made us with different personalities and different makeup. And so uh, there are some people out there who really seem to misunderstand this, especially when it comes to uh, how God uses people today. There was a guy who was once part of this church, and he left this church because I wasn't like him. Right? I didn't like the things that he liked. You know, I wasn't. I was, I'm not a hunter or a or a fisher, fisherman, right? You know, a, a fisherman. I don't fish fish. I like to eat fish, and I like to eat, you know, deer, and I like to eat whatever. And I'll eat whatever you whatever you shoot, but I don't really go out and shoot it. Okay, I don't know what to tell you. I, I never did it when I was a kid. I haven't done it as an adult. I, that's not to say I never would do it, but um, I'm not. I don't like. Uh, hanging out in, in the country and doing country types of things that much. It's, it's not what I typically do. I, you know, people have said that I'm more like a city person. Well, I, I enjoy going to the city. I like going, there's a lot of things to do in the city, you know, a lot of things to see in the city. I like going to a ball game or a, or a hockey hockey match or, you know, go to see the Statue of Liberty or hang out in New York City somewhere. You know, it's just that's the type of thing that I tend to like to do. And it's okay. That we don't necessarily love the same things. I like baseball. Some of you guys would rather watch grass grow. Right? You might actually watch, you might actually see more than certain baseball games, right? Some of you think that racing is a sport. You know, so we're <laughs> we're different, you know, we got different personalities. Some people are more quiet, some people are out there going, and God uses different people. And that's how he used people when he wrote down his word. The apostle Paul is a different person than the Apostle Peter. They're very different people. And you can go through different writers in Scripture, like Jeremiah, very, seemingly very different type of writing than the Apostle Paul, for instance. Or John, seemingly different writer than, say, Matthew, the tax collector. All right, so God uses these different people. He uses these different personalities, these different writing styles, as he breathes out his word. He uses real people to do his work just like he does today, even though they're different from each other. Uh, I would say this. There is no way, if, if you're this guy, if you were this guy who left our church because I wasn't enough like the guy, I didn't like the same things that he liked, uh, then, then I, would, I would say you're never going to find, it's just try to, try to imagine the implications of that in a local church. Are any of you like the same, for the most part? Most of you are somewhat different. Just look around this room right now. I'm looking at different people with very different personalities. Anthony, he's outgoing. He's always cracking jokes. Mr. Reed is very, very serious. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's some very, very different personalities here. There are more quiet people. I don't want to name some certain people are more than more outgoing people. There are older people and younger people. 
And, uh, you know, try to imagine my pastor, if everyone thought my pastor would be just like me. But you couldn't possibly have that guy exist. He doesn't exist. He doesn't exist. And nowhere in Scripture does it say that that's a requirement for ministry anyway. The Apostle Paul was very different than a lot of the Gentile places he went and ministered to. So, um, and Jesus is very different. Than Western American culture, okay, and, and so is Eastern culture in general. But uh, biblical inspiration takes place as God uses these individual people, uses these individual personalities in order to record his word. Sometimes they didn't even know, seemingly didn't even know that they were writing scripture. And in some cases, they had the best faith of the we have the, uh, the former situation. I write this, not the Lord. Well, sometimes the Apostle Paul didn't even realize that he was writing God-breathed stuff. Biblical inspiration is God's superintending of, and when I say superintending, I mean oversight. So think of like an overseer. Uh, biblical inspiration is God's overseeing of the reception and communication of his word, such that the product, that is God's word, is fully authoritative and without error in the originals. And so that's that's how inspiration works. God superintended, he oversaw the human author such that using their own personalities, using their own writing styles, they composed and recorded God's revelation without error. You think about that, it's like, wow, that's crazy. Right? That is, like, how can you even imagine? Yet, God, for God, it's nothing. For God, it's nothing. Now, this is not something we're going to unpack a ton tonight, but the, you should take note that the original writings were inspired by God. The original writings, the original manuscripts were inspired. They were breathed out, and thus without error. Now, these texts have been copied by men, and um, men who copy these texts would sometimes make errors as they copy. You might be sitting there saying, <gasps> what? This is heresy? Well, all you have to do, right? Because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there, even when they christen them. All you have to do is take manuscripts and read manuscripts and compare manuscripts. And you're going to find out these manuscripts are different. All right? They're, they're, they're almost, I don't think there are any two manuscripts that are exactly the same. So those original writings are inspired by God, they're breathed out, they're without error, they've been copied by men, sometimes copied and copied and copied and copied, right? Uh, the copies are not re-inspired. So it's important to understand this. The original, God, is, when, when, when the Apostle Paul wrote from his pen on paper, or even John uses the, the term pen and ink, or pen and paper, right? Uh, that was breathed out by God. But a 15th century manuscript that was copied 1,400 years later is not re-inspired. It's a copy of what God had inspired. And so some people really get this messed up and then their Bible translation and understanding gets really messed up. They're copies of the original text. As Bible translators translate from the copies, so now we're talking beyond how we have originals, we have copies, and now we have translations. As Bible translators translate from the copies, they are not re-inspired either. So no English translation is re-inspired as though God were inspiring a second and a third time and over and over and over. The original manuscripts are breathed out and the copies are made, and the translations are made from those copies. Hopefully, not always the case, I would say. Like, for instance, in the New World Translation, you would not call that a translation based on copies, by any means. Or the uh, copy patch version of the Gospel of John would not be based on manuscript evidence, or you might even say uh, any of the paraphrased Bibles really aren't based on manuscript evidence. Um, maybe an example of that might be something not really based on the manuscripts. Translations are not re-inspired manuscripts.
Oh, by, by the way, um, before we get, because I don't want to, I'm not trying to shake anyone's faith. This is an illustration that some of you have seen in the past. I think uh, probably Mr. Metcalf, probably Mr. Weedy, probably, probably my wife, maybe Chad, probably Anthony. A couple of you guys have seen this in the past. Maybe Andrew, I'm not sure. This is really like not realistic, so to speak, but it's a basic idea of, of how the manuscripts might work. So let's just imagine for the sake of the argument that you have, and, and, and if, you're, if you're looking at this from home and you're saying, uh, you know, give me the manuscripts you're talking about, this is, this is a hypothetical illustration, okay, to kind of show you how, how looking at the copies works. Um, this is not based on any actual manuscript. But let's imagine we have a papyrus manuscript, which would be, which would be a very old manuscript. We have very old papyrus manuscripts, okay? Um, so we're dating back to maybe the second century, early second century, late 100s, stuff, stuff like that even. We have some manuscripts dating all the way back to then. Well, let's imagine that we see a reading, and in that, in that, in that let's call it 18 verses, Okay, just for the sake of the argument, let's call this uh, John 1, 1 through 18, right? And that's, again, this is hypothetical. We see errors in verse 5 and 11, and maybe in this case it's uh, spelling errors. Okay, and so, you know, you might look at that and say, well, anybody who would look at that would understand that a word that's repeated twice is an error. All right, so the guy just wrote a word down. You ever, you ever, you ever write something down and you write... You write through the line and you're copying and then you write the exact same line a second time. That stuff happens, okay? Or you're writing something down and there's a word, that same word shows up two lines later and you skip up ahead and, and miss the whole middle part. You know, that stuff happens in, 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 in copies. Well, anyway, let's say we have mistakes in the copies in verses 5 and 11 for the sake of the argument. And then we have another papyrus manuscript which has a reading and now you see a difference in verse 2 and in verse 8. All right, now, now in verse 2, verse 5, verse 8, verse 11, they're all kind of in question. Which is the right reading? Is papyrus 1 correct in verse 2, or is papyrus 2 correct? Right? And it seems like, oh no, we're in trouble. Right? Now let's enter in papyrus 3. And maybe there's a mistake in verse 3, and verse 9, and verse 15, and verse 17. And now as we start comparing, we say, oh look, look at verse 2. Uh, papyrus 2 is probably wrong there. All right? The right reading is in Papyrus 1, the right reading is in Papyrus 3, and so on and so forth. As, as you start lining up, you start seeing, okay, now we have a, 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 basically a complete Bible from, let's call it the 4th century, all right? Um, Codex Adepinus. And as we start, we see maybe in verse 4 there's an issue, and in verse 10. And as you start lining up these, these manuscripts, you start, it's, the, the picture becomes clear where the mistakes are in these copies. Uh, we'll, we'll continue down the line. You know, maybe Sinaitic text, that's another maybe 4th century, maybe 5th century, almost a complete Bible. It's like a codex, like a big book. All right? And uh, maybe, some people think, maybe one of the 50 Bibles that uh, Constantine ordered to be copied uh, when he quote unquote converted to uh, Christendom. Uh, I hate to say Christian name because it doesn't sound like genuine conversion to me. But now let's say you have these, let's say you have these manuscripts, right? And, and Alexandrinus, which is a fifth century uh, 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 codex, like the big book. Right? And, and, and as you start building up, you start coming back up. <laughs> Uh, you could look down and say at verse 11, and you can see, look at this reading, is consistent in verse 11, but the mistake really becomes clear. All right? The spelling mistake, or the word that was left out, or something like that. And if you go to verse 15, you can see there's consistency in all the copies, but then the clear mistake shows up in papyrus, uh, whatever, 3. Again, again, it's an illustration. This is not based on actual manuscripts. This is basically an illustration to show you how textual criticism works. To kind of show you, look, God inspired the original autographs, which we don't have anymore. At least we don't think we have them. We have all these copies, and copies have errors in them. 
And so people might, people might say, well, if that's the case, then we don't have an inerrant scripture. And our translations fall. We say, well, that's not the case. Because when you compare the manuscript evidence, you, you can basically find out what the right reading is. That's not to say it's 100% always easy to figure out. Sometimes there's a certain level of question, well, should this have said of him or of God? You know, there, Nothing that's significant. Nothing that changes any doctrine. And, uh, and there's, a, there's a commentary out there put out by uh, uh, Bruce Metzger. I think it's called a textual commentary of the New Testament. And I use it all the time. And when I, when part of my Bible study process is I want to see what he has to say. I want to see what the manuscript evidence says about this passage. And most of the time, there's really nothing. It's, it's much ado about nothing. Most of the time, I don't even, it doesn't even factor into my Bible study. Because it doesn't change anything. There's like three places in the New Testament where there's anything really significant that actually happens. Maybe, maybe you call John 1, 18 a fourth. But there's this really not in question when you look at, you know, all the manuscript evidence. Well, one of the things that stand out to me when you have, you know, let's just call it some of these really old manuscripts. And these are just really old manuscripts. And the highest ones in the tree are made off of, you understand. Um, these three aren't made up. They're significant because of their age, because they're early, early copies. And the farther along you get away from the originals, the more types of copies, copy mistakes might show up. Right? Sometimes writings in the mar there are, there are writings in certain English translations that only show up like in the margins of copies, or primarily show up in the margins of copies. And then we come down to what I would call the textus. What we're calling here the Texas Receptus uh, model, which might have all these different varied readings, right? And, and, and they're kind of, as you compare through, you kind of see, okay, this is probably, this is like a 16th century, 15th century, 16th century type of thing. All right, so now as you get much older, you're talking, you know, let's call it second, third, fourth, fifth century. You know, you can look at those, you can look at the differences and really kind of figure out what's going on. And then as you get down to the 15th, 16th century, you, you know, you might look at a Greek manuscript and be like, wow, look at some of the differences. And, and then you look at those earlier manuscripts and it's kind of easy to, not easy, but it's a lot easier to figure out what's the original reading. So, so what ends up happening is when you get a manuscript evidence, there might be a few verses in question. Because let's say we look at verse 2. And there was a mistake here. All these were consistent, but this one and this one read differently. Then we look at it and say, well, one of these two readings is right. Which one is right? And you look at the manuscript evidence, and you pretty much figure out which one's right. right. There may be a little bit of a question. There may be a little bit more of a question as to which is the right reading. But as you compare the manuscript evidence, you can figure out what the original reading is. This process is why I started preaching from the American standpoint. Uh, and I'll probably talk about that a little bit more, maybe later, maybe, maybe later, maybe next week, right? Why the New American Standard or the English Standard Version is that why there's such excellent translations because they take into account all the manuscript evidence, particularly the most oldest and reliable manuscripts they take into account. Whereas there are some other, uh, there are some other translations that, and, and I, I put in here a line here that says text critical. Uh, the, 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 the critical text, which would be maybe like a final Greek text, where this, again, it's hypothetical, where you can figure out where the copy mistakes are and pretty much remove them. Right? And, then, and then that's the basis behind a Bible like the American Standard. We can have a scripture and know what God said. And it be extremely reliable and based on the inherent original autographs without error. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a feel of, of that process. Well, anyway, the translation itself is not re-inspired. What I find in a lot of doctrinal statements and uh, from missionaries and from churches, fundamental Baptist church a lot of times, is that the, uh, the King James, they talk about the King James like it's Re-inspired. They may not use the word re-inspired, but that's essentially what they, some will, some will say that, 
Uh, but most of the time it says something like the King James is God's translation for the English speaking world. Or, 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 or there's language that implies that God selected this one. And that really, that's just not how it works. That's, that's, that's not how God inspires. God does not re-inspire translations. The King James is not a re-inspired manuscript. Translations are simply that. They are translations, and some of them are very good translations. And we have three excellent translations in English today. Uh, those three excellent translations in our English, in the language of the day, uh, is uh, they're the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, and we could have even say the New King James Version. Uh, there are some other ones that are okay. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of certain translation philosophies, so I'm not the biggest fan. I don't really like the NIV. I don't really like the CSV. Uh, CSV. Uh, Christian Standard Version, um, but there are some people, some good people, who do like those translations. I like a translation that seeks to get the very words right in the very order they were in, as, mu as much as possible. Go ahead. Have you ever had issues in this church with members because of, you don't know, use the King James or a preferred version of theirs? Are you trying to, are you, words. it's an honest question. Are you trying, you're not trying to draw a story? No, I, I, don't, I really don't know, I just, because I know, I know there's many people that left, and I don't know. If, you know um, obviously, you're not going to name names, but has that been an issue with people that have actually left or had issues with you? I don't know that I'd say people that have left so much. Um, you know, what's funny is uh, if I stopped having like a ladies' tea, the world went insane. But if I change the Bible version, no one even cared. You know what I mean? If I did post like the United States flag inside of the building, everyone goes insane like you're a communist and you start talking like that. And, but if I preach from a different version, no one even bat an eye. Remove the rails from outside. Move the, yeah. move the railing from outside, take the flower beds out, and you've just, you know, killed the sacred cow, you know, let's crucify you and upside down. But uh but change the Bible translation, nobody cared. Which was wild. It was just wild. I was expecting a lot of different uh, of, a, of a resistance from that. But uh, but there was a guy who came in here as a guest, and um, and you know I, I'm I'm really kind of devoted to original languages. Uh, translations are we have excellent translations, but at the end of the day we have we have many, like we have original language manuscripts, and those are really valuable manuscripts. So I'm always looking at those. I mean it's it's hard to think that there are. There are many sermons that go by where I don't look at the original manuscripts, at least at least New Testament manuscripts. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's some old, some Hebrew. I don't really spend a whole lot of time looking at Hebrew because it's so hard to read, it takes so long. But when it comes to New Testament manuscripts, it's like there's barely any messages that were preached that, where I didn't spend time looking at the original language. And uh, you know, maybe I was reading a passage and I said, now the original language says this. And the guy says, it goes better than God <laughs> because I, because I, uh, you know, at the time I was using the King James and I said something that wasn't exactly in favor of the King James reading. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that's one that your brother and I laugh about all the time. I thought that's what you're trying to go out, but yeah. So not really, but uh, I'll get phone calls from people and uh, they, they want to ask, they want to ask questions about the church, and one of the first questions a lot of people ask is, are you, do you use the King James Bible? And they never say King James translation, they say King James Bible. And when they say that, I know exactly what I'm dealing with, and, and usually that means still about an hour long conversation, and sometimes it's very productive, and sometimes it ends with someone being really angry, uh, and that someone's not me, that's the other guy. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, that's something that's out there, it's, it's really out there. And, and, and I know, like, I know one pastor who says, you should be reading from the King James Bible. And if you don't understand it, then you should have a dictionary next to you. Uh, when I said there were three excellent translations, I said that with intent. And I didn't say the King James for a reason, because the King James is not in modern English. It's not in the language of the day. It's not in the lingua franca. Um, it's not a modern translation. It's not a translation in our language, so to speak. So uh, it was an excellent translation in its day. 
uh, for its language and the resources it had at the time. But uh, unfortunately, it doesn't take into account all the translation, all the manuscript evidence that we have available to us. Today. We have over 5,850 manuscripts available, and the Greek text that stood behind the original King James, the first version of it, had seven manuscripts available. You know, Erasmus, uh, original Texas Receptus, had seven incomplete Greek manuscripts. Can you compare that? To, now, it's a little bit of scrolling because they had more additions and more manuscripts and things like that, but, but um, we have over 5,850. Why would we discredit the oldest and most reliable manuscripts? I mean, here's another, another kind of illustration that I, I pulled up just in case a question like that came up. Um, you know, when we think of uh, Bibles, we think of the King James as an older translation, and therefore maybe more reliable. And we think of like New American Standard and the ESV as later translations, and more modern translations, therefore less reliable. But in actuality, uh, so, sorry. This is how people view it. This is actuality. In actuality, the King James is based on manuscripts that come from this time frame, 9th to 13th century, whereas the American Standard is based on manuscripts that cover all of that time frame. So, so the King James really kind of ignores or discounts those earliest manuscripts. So when you ask which Bible is the older, more reliable Bible, you can rightly say that the text behind the New American Standard is the older and more reliable manuscript even though the King James is 400 years older. Uh, Chad. So, obviously there's a problem still discovering manuscripts. Are there manuscripts that they are discovering like they're being, that it's like, okay, there may be another translation to come out? I mean, is it, or is it just, what they're saying is just reinforcing the put on the, the New American Standard and the CSP. So, so uh, <clears throat> there's always going to be more translations. And, and in fact, we'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, I don't know if we'll get there this week. Probably more like next week. But the King James, uh, they took a lot of heat for that translation because there hadn't been a translation in 200 years. And they said, why do we need more translations? You know, the, the, the translation we have is perfectly fine. Why would you? I mean, it was like, it was like sacrilege for them to go and translate the King James Bible. The same argument the King James people use today was the same argument used against them when they were publishing the, uh, you know, uh, what you might, you might almost call a Catholic document because it was based on a Catholic document put out by Erasmus, a, a foul mouthed Roman Catholic priest, and ordered by the Anglican Church, which is basically a Roman Catholic church without the Pope. So, so that whole document is really kind of based. And, and, and approved and authorized by Roman Catholicism for the most part. I mean, it's not exactly, but it's essentially the same thing. You know, like the Anglican Church, Church of England, is Rome without the Pope. It's the same thing. They have almost all the same doctrines and whatever else. So, so you know, they were taking a lot of heat for that translation. Now, 400 years later, right, it's like, how dare you? come up with a new translation. We have the 1611 King James, which no one can read, by the way. I mean, I can read it, but a few people can read it, but a lot of people can't read that in its original. You know, usually they're using something like the 17, it's, it's a late, uh, late 18th century, late 18th century translation, edition of the King James that people read today. And they claim in their doctrinal statement even, we believe in the inerrancy of the 1611 King James Bible, even though not going to be able and they're reading the late 18th century, King James edition. So, um, anyway, I don't know if that, that helps, but they're talking about additions to the New American Standard. They're talking, about, they've done additions of the New American Standard with 1995 edition, it was 1970, uh, 71, I think, edition. Uh, and then, you know, nobody was really expecting a whole lot in 2001, the ESV came out, and that was like, oh, oh you know, game changer in seminaries. It's like, wow, this is pretty awesome. You know, seminaries got real excited about that. Uh, and for good reason, for really good reason. I think that some of the changes that are coming in the New American Standard. It was, not, it was a 2020 version. My, my Bible app. It was 1995 was the last one. I'm, I'm not happy 
with the 2020 versions. I started to read it, and some of the changes were really uh, disappointing, and I chose not to uh, not to download it. I'm going to stick with the 95 version. But anyway, so uh, we can talk more about that maybe on the side. Uh, let me kind of get back to this because I haven't really gotten very far. So anyway, um, King James is not a re it's not a re-inspired manuscript. It is a translation. Uh, good translation societies examine the ancient manuscripts to uncover the original reading, kind of like that process we talked about with, with the, you know, all the different manuscripts. They, they want to weigh the manuscripts. So that is, I want to look at manuscripts from the 2nd century. I want to look at manuscripts from the 4th and 5th century. Even though there aren't as many of them, of course there's not going to be as many of them, right? I mean, most of them have probably become disintegrated or been destroyed or whatever. I can't just count those manuscripts, because we may have thousands of manuscripts from the 9th, the 10th, the 11th, 12th, 13th century, and we may not have nearly that many from the 2nd all the way up to say the 8th century, the very old ancient manuscripts, but those ancient manuscripts, you got to weigh those out. They, they are significant. It's, it's like uh, to ignore those is to basically say if they didn't have the Bible, if Erasmus didn't have those manuscripts when he translated his Greek New Testament, then we should count them. And that's an error. That's a big error. That's what we would call in baseball terms uh, a mental error. What do we used to call those? M-E-R-R? -R? Mental error. Mental error. Yeah, if he made a mental error, yeah, he sort of struck out looking. Yeah, he struck out looking at the run seven laps around the field. I only had one, one mental error. In, in high school, and, and then I begrudgingly ran those seven laps. I wasn't happy. Josh, uh, you got some laps to run. Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> my, mouth, my mouth usually got me the area. Your mouth did. My lawn mowing did. Anyway, um, so, uh, so uh, what I would do with Josh is if, if, if the ball went under his glove, now that was in, it's in a mental area maybe, but push ups. If the ball goes under your glove, do push ups. So it's a different concept. But, but it's a mental error. Uh, that's, that's what it is when you just when you, when you do not take into account the oldest and most reliable manuscripts. And that's really kind of what the King James the King James tradition does. It doesn't take into account those manuscripts. And, um, and, and that's unfortunate. Anyway, uh, we can look at our Bibles, many of them at least, New King James, King James, you'd say, uh, even though it's not in the language of today. Even though people died, and we'll talk about that next week, people died to get the Bible into the language of today. Uh, that matters, getting the Bible in the language of the day. I think we have enough Bibles in the language of the day right now. I think we certainly do, and that's why I, I'm, I'm very particular about the ones I like. I like what's considered a formal equivalent translation. That's what a lot of people would call a word for word, even though there's really no such thing because the language is so different. But we'll call, for the sake of the argument, we'll call it a word for word translation. That's why I like the American standard. When I did my translation work in a seminary, and, and compare it to English translation, of course you can do that, right? I just translate it through a chapter of the Bible. I want to read English versions and find out which one is, you know, first off, did I get it right? And second off, you know, which one is the closest to the translation that I, that I did? And, I'm going to tell you, this one won out. This one won out all the time. So I was shocked. I went to my seminary professor and said, what's going on here? My readings are exactly like the New American, my translations are exactly like the New American translations, like almost word for word, exact. And he said, yeah, that's right. I was like, what? Like I was expecting maybe it should have been like a King James. I didn't know what, I, I didn't, I just, it, was, it was surprising to me. And, and at that point, I, I began to realize we have a really good translation. We have an excellent translation, and the ESV is also an excellent translation. Uh, anyway, uh, the, this book, uh, though it is a translation, though it has not been re-inspired, is a translation of the inspired Word of God, such that we can say, and it's, and it's accurate, such that we can say, and reliable, such that we can say that what we have here is, they are the very words of God. This is the inspired word of God. And when I do the, when I do the language work, and I see maybe there's a, a, a little bit of a nuanced difference between 
my translation of what's in this book. Uh, the idea is basically exactly the same. Nothing has changed. This is the word of God. This is a reliable word of God that you can trust in. Uh, God inspired the writings. Not the authors. Uh, the scriptures make it clear that it was the writings that were inspired. And if we look at 2 Timothy 3.16, that's what we see. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, uh, thoroughly furnished to every good work, prepared for every good work. Yes, men of God were moved along as they, uh, they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, uh, but it was the writings, the scripture, the scripture is what is inspired, is what is God-breathed. The men were only the vehicles through which God inspired his word. Now, uh, there are some terms, let me see if I can, hmm. yeah, I think we have time. Let me see if I can get through some of this in our church constitution. statement, right? For good reason. We believe in the Bible as the verbally and plenarily, I'm not sure, plenary or plenary, I'm assuming plenarily is the verb, is the adverb. Uh, we believe in the Bible as the verbally, that is every word, and the plenarily, that is all the words, completely inspired word of God, uh, as contained in the original manuscripts. That all portions of scripture are equally inspired and contain no contradiction. We believe that the scriptures are to be the only rule of faith and practice, or at least the primary, the main rule, the authoritative rule of faith and practice for the believer in Jesus Christ. We believe that the canon, the 66 books of the Bible, is complete. Nothing shall be added to it or taken away from it. And so uh, verbal inspiration, which you see here, we believe in the Bible as the verbally inspired word of God. Verbal is the individual words of the Bible have been breathed out by God. The individual words are inspired. The plenary inspiration of Scripture is that every word and all the words are breathed out by God. And these two words are used, and these are words you should look for, verbal and plenary inspiration. You should look for those words in doctrinal statements, because they essentially... They, they're, they're, they speak comprehensively, they're exhaustive terms. That the Bible is inspired by God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that scripture is given for our own instruction to bring us closer to Him. And you can read that in passages like, for instance, Romans 15, 4, which says, For whatever was written in earlier times is written for our instruction, so that through perseverance, and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope, right? We, we have the things that are recorded in God's word really recorded in part for our instruction. Uh, God's word itself suggests uh, verbal and plenary inspiration in, uh, for instance, when Moses wrote down, check this out. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain. Now, Deuteronomy speaks a little bit about this, uh, about adding to or taking away from the word. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Some people will say, hey, look, that means you can't add anything to the Bible. And, uh, and, and, and I would say that's actually a misunderstanding of what the passage says. It looks like that outside of its context. If that were the case, then the Bible would have ended with the book of Deuteronomy uh, in 1406 B.C. I'll tell you what this means in a second. In Deuteronomy 12.32, we see the same phrase. Uh, 
whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to nor take away from it. We see the same terminology at the very end of the Bible in uh, Revelation 22, 18, and 19. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, the book of Revelation. If anyone adds to them, some people will they'll say, well, this, is, this book is the Bible, but this book is the book of Revelation, right, in its context. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book, Revelation. And if anyone takes away from the words of this, the book of this prophecy, Revelation, the book of Revelation, God will take away his part from the tree of life and the whole city which are written in this book. Now there are people out there that say you can't add a book of scripture and they'll quote these verses as the support. Or they'll say you can't take away and then they'll go, oh look, Open up uh, such and such a passage in your New American Standard Bible. And now open up that same passage in the King James Bible. And look at all the verses that the New American Standard added, or took away, or the words they added. Or, and, and they make an argument like that based on a complete misunderstanding of what this is even saying. And, and they're wrong in that the standard against which we measure Bibles isn't another translation. It's the original manuscripts, you understand? Like, the, the standard is not a 17th century, essentially, Roman Catholic document. It's the thousands upon thousands of manuscripts that we have of the Greek New Testament. That's the standard that we're measuring any translation by including the King We don't measure translations against another translation as a standard. We're measuring all translations against the manuscript. Well, anyway, what these verses are not saying is that you can't make translations that are different than other translations. What they are saying is that God's word is absolutely authoritative. God's written word is absolutely authoritative. Isaiah, uh, we see verbal and plenary inspiration suggested in Isaiah 30. And verse 8, when he was told to write down the very words of God in the prophecy, now go write it on a tablet before them and inscribe it on a scroll that it may serve in time to come as a witness forever. Listen to what Jesus says in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 18, right after the Beatitudes. He says, uh, truly I say to you, heaven and earth, uh, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. The authority of Scripture. The authority of the words of Scripture. All right, we see it again later in Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew 24, 35, where uh, Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. God's word is all that we need for life and godliness. And Peter says that in 2 Peter 1. Listen to this. Simon Peter <clears throat> Bond servant, apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have received the faith, the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is kind of an important Christological passage uh, in the original language. This is essentially a likening uh, as God and Savior are together, are connected in such a way, and then identify him as Jesus Christ. This is a, a passage saying that Jesus Christ is divine. But anyway, uh, that's not what we're focusing on today. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, that is, we have everything that we need for life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and glory. We have everything that we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, which we find where? In esoteric experiences, in chantings and the speaking of tongues, we find it in the Word of God. This is how we have everything we need for life and godliness. We, we, we understand what we understand about God through this book that He inspired. That he breathed out, uh, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who will call us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, 
So that by then we may become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world by loss. Uh, God himself spoke these words about his book. God uh, recorded these words in his book. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also we made the world. God spoke to us through his Son. And Jesus promised those disciples that God would bring to remembrance all things that he spoke, such that when they wrote down the words of the New Testament, they were moved by God's Spirit. We read about that in John 14 through 16, passages that often get to understand. And so you can almost say God pre authenticated the New Testament and Jesus pre authenticated the New Testament, even the book of Revelation in John 14, uh, which we'll look at next week. So we have this book that is authoritative. Uh, Again, no translation is re inspired. So don't go worshiping translations, as our old pastor said. We don't worship translations in this church, he used to say. Um, but we have so many manuscripts that verify what God said in the originals that we can look at our Bibles today. At least the Bibles that look at all the manuscript evidence and say so we have the very words of God here. That, along with some of these passages, uh, show us that the Word of God is verbally and plenarily inspired. Now, uh, I probably got a little ahead of myself. Next week, I do want to talk a little bit about um, the philosophy of the King James. Um, and uh, I probably said a few of those things already, but we're a little bit out of time here. Do we have any questions or comments right now before, uh, before we stop? I'll ask you later. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Anyone else? All right. Um, if you're not sure, you should ask it right now and talk to me privately, and I'll, I'll try to help you. And, and maybe, uh, maybe even something they'll talk next week, or uh, or something that we'll end up talking about next week. If if, uh, if that's something we should do. Okay, uh, let's take our hymnals and turn to 294. 294. And we will close our service with a hymn. Our Bible study with a hymn. That's King Game language. They went out to the Mount of Olives and they sung an end. 294.